Okay, good morning. Good morning. Welcome, welcome to worship wherever you are. Sitting on your, in your bed, sitting in your living room, sitting in your dining room, sitting in the kitchen. Welcome. We at Bethel welcome you. So if you announcement, um, there will be a new song, so get ready for it. It's a song from Sudan. So um, just listen when we are singing. You might be uh, wanting to sing with us, so you're welcome to do that. It's called Mura Salat. So before we do that, let's um, let's take a deep breath together to allow to allow the Holy Spirit, um, the Holy Spirit that connects us with one another, to be in us. The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, that allow us to see one another, another as human beings, as um, uh, siblings in Christ. God bless our flaws, imperfections, and the mess we are. The Holy Spirit that gives life. The life when it's taken away from us or from one of us affect all of us. So let's breathe together. We are here to receive Christ. We are called to proclaim Christ. We are sent to show Christ. Blessed be the Holy Spirit, one God, the fountain of living water, the rock we give us birth, our light and our salvation. Amen. Amen. Joined to Christ in the waters of baptism, we are clothed with God's mercy and forgiveness. Let us give thanks to the gift of baptism. We give you thanks, O God. For in the beginning, your spirit moved over the waters, and by your word, you created the world, calling forth life, in which you took delight. To the waters of the flood, you delivered Noah and his family. To the sea you led your people Israel from slavery into freedom. At the river, the Son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By water and your word, you claim us as daughters and sons, making us heirs of your promise and servants of all. We praise you for the gift of water that sustains us. And above all, we praise you for the gift of new life in Jesus Christ. Shower us with your spirit. And we know our lives with your forgiveness, grace, and love. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen.
mold us into a people who welcome your word and serve one another. To Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. So you're probably wondering what the title means. Um, this piece is more of like an experiential kind of piece. So what I want you to do as, as I play is close your eyes and help paint a picture uh, for, this, for this song. Um, for some people it might be different, but that, that's kind of the point. Everybody has their own perspective of it. So just have fun and uh, have a journey. Good morning. Good morning. I hope that everyone is doing well in these difficult and trying times. And I pray that you are keeping cool during this rather hot spell we are going through at the moment. So let us pray. Called into unity with one another and the whole creation, let us pray for our shared world. Please pray for a star for Renee, for Bob, for Neil and Linda, for Al, for Michaela, for Sadie, for Sophia, for Gabe, for Ken, for Virginia, for Don, for Art, for Eileen, for Ken, for Jackie, for Cecilia, for Martha, for Richard and Vicky, for Tina and Mary, Marty, for Ethel, for Liam, for Doris, 
for Meghan, for Whitney, for Myrtle, for Maria, for Paul, for Karen, for Don, for Tyler, for Doris, for Eloise, for Charles, for Steve, for Tom, and for Carol. At this time, we also pray for those who are battling the COVID-19 virus, those who have lost loved ones, those who are dealing with job and financial challenges, those who have to be hospitalized with other conditions at this time. We pray for the medical personnel, the doctors, nurses, the caregivers, the various hospital workers, first responders, especially the police, fire brigade, uh, EMTs, ambulance drivers, and those who are serving in uh, essential jobs. Our national and world leaders and infection specialists, and in particular, all of us, because all of our lives have been affected. We also pray for the men, women and families of those who serve in the military. Uh, we also pray for our society in general, that there may be an end to the violence and hatred, and that God's peace may envelop us and help us to see each other through his eyes of love. We also pray for our seminary graduate, Sarah Gorman, who is waiting for her first call. We also pray for our benevolence for this particular month, the Kairos Prison Ministry, and the good work that a couple of our members actually undergo through that particular ministry. And we finally pray for our own church here at Bethel Lutheran. We pray for Pastor Mitch, the church council, the church staff members, the Sierra Pacific Synod, Bishop Mark Holmrood, and obviously the people of Bethel, and the virtual vacation Bible school that we are actually working on for the period July 12th through July 16th. Uh, we ask all these various prayers in your son's precious name. Amen. Amen. Good, morning. Good morning. Good morning. The first lesson is from Jeremiah chapter 28, verses 5 through 9. Then the prophet Jeremiah spoke to the prophet Hananiah in the presence of the priests and all the people who were standing in the house of the Lord. And the prophet Jeremiah said, Amen. May the Lord do so. May the Lord fulfill the words that you have prophesied and bring back to this place from Babylon the vessels of the house of the Lord and all the exiles. But listen now to this word that I speak in your hearing and in the hearing of all the people. The prophets who preceded you and me from ancient times prophesied war, famine, and pestilence against many countries and great kingdoms. As for the prophet who prophesies his peace, when the word of that prophet comes true, then it will be known that the Lord has truly sent the prophet. Here ends the first lesson. Our psalm for today is Psalm 89. Ooh. Mm.
The second lesson comes from Romans 6, verses 12 through 23. Therefore, do not let sin exercise dominion in your mortal bodies to make you obey their passions. No longer present your members to sin as instruments of wickedness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. And present your members to God as instruments of righteousness. For sin will have no dominion over you, since you are not under law, but under grace. What then? Should we sin because we are not under law, but under grace? By no means do you not know that if you present yourselves to anyone as obedient slaves, you are slaves of the one whom you obey, either of sin, which leads to death, or of obedience, which leads to righteousness. But thanks be to God that you, having once been slaves of sin, have become obedient from the heart to the form of teaching to which you were entrusted, and that you, having been set free from sin, have become slaves of righteousness. I am speaking in human terms because of your natural limitations. For just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and to greater and greater inequity, so now present your members as slaves to righteousness for sanctification. When you were slaves of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. So what advantage did you then get from the things of which you are now ashamed. The end of those things is death. But now that you have been freed from sin and enslaved to God, the advantage you get is sanctification. The end is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Here ends the second reading.
wonder why we are singing that song because we cannot gather together in one place. But wherever you are, you are welcome to worship with us. You are welcome to make that place a better place for everyone you meet in your life. That's the message of the song. Even though we are not together in one place, but we are together virtually. Amen. Three summers ago, I led two mission trips to Haiti back to back. One with the Episcopal Diocese of North Dakota and the other with Masaya Lutheran Church in North Dakota as well. The purpose of the trip was both for both groups was to build relationship with the Haitian people. So we traveled places to witness the churches, schools, professional and classical education, water projects, guest houses, and an orphanage. One of the places we visited with Mazaya Lutheran Church was St. Joseph Home in Port-au-Prince, the capital of Haiti. St. Joseph Home is a home for disadvantaged youth, former street children, and former child slaves. He provides them with an education and a family and an abundance of love and support. So when I arrived with the group um, at St. Joseph in the courtyard of the guest house, we were welcomed and given a cup of cold water by Bill Nathan, the director. Mr. Nathan was once a child slave and has been living in this place since he was about eight years old. Later on that day at the dinner table, I asked him, why did he serve a cup of cold water to each one of us? He told us that it has been the tradition of the home to welcome each member of the family with a glass of cold water to, fill, to fulfill what Jesus has said in Matthew chapter 10, verses 40 to 42. So my sibling in Christ, this is our scripture for today. I don't believe in coincidence. I believe God is at work right here at this moment. So let me reread the passage for you all. I invite you all to pay attention and reflect on it. Jesus said, Whoever welcomes you welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes the one who sent me. Who sent him? God. Whoever welcomes a prophet in the name of a prophet will receive a prophet's reward. And whoever welcomes a righteous person in the name of a righteous person will receive the reward of the righteous. And whoever gives even a cup of cold water to one of these little ones in the name of a disciple, truly I tell you, none of this will lose their reward. I have to tell you, Matthew is not the only one who talks about welcoming the way he does in verse 40. Mark and Luke both refer to welcoming a child in Jesus' name as equivalent to welcoming Jesus. But Matthew is unique, leaving out a reference to little one until verse 42. Here in, instead, Jesus says, Whoever welcomes you, welcomes me. The tight connection between Jesus and his apostles established at the very beginning of the mission instructions appears once more. To welcome Jesus is to welcome the one who sent him, and to welcome the one he has sent is to welcome the Messiah himself. According to Mr. Nathan, we were welcomed as if we were sent by the Messiah himself. But our passage takes the question of reception even further. How does reception of the apostles by other relate to the reception of Jesus whom they preach? 
To what degree is hospitality itself an indication of discipleship? The kind of hospitality Jesus is talking about is not a limited one. It is not a hospitality that is reserved, reserved only for people who look just like us. The same race, same nationality, same economic background, same gender, all who speak the same language. It is rather unity without uniformity. The kind of hospitality Jesus is talking about is not the kind that tells the person we receive that they have to change to become like us to match our own expectation, whatever that is. If we insist that they dress, speak, look like us, we are not exercising hospitality. It is instead to accept the person for who they are, to meet people, as they are. Sometimes being hospitable requires us to make decisions we never thought we would make. In other words, hospitality sometimes can be very discomforting. There is that story in Genesis where God asked Abraham to sacrifice his son Isaac. It is a very discomforting story to read as a mother myself of three beautiful human beings. This demon from God is a violent swerve away from the path set out for Abraham and his descendants. If God was going to ask Abraham to sacrifice his son, why had God let him send his older son Ishmael away as he did in last week's scripture reading? Think how we might struggle if asked to do something that not only went against our hopes for the future, but upending our understanding of and with God. The brief, the brief text from the Gospel this week concludes the instruction of Jesus to the disciples as he sent them out to represent him. He has warned them that they will not be universally well received, that his message will set family members against one another, that they may must lose their lives in order to find them. They are bringing a countercultural message, and we can't help but remember that the reward most prophets receive is persecution, not popularity. Oftentimes God asks us to do something that goes against our hopes for the future and our past understandings of who God wants us to be. We cannot count on our usual practices to, to carry us through the time of grief and uncertainty. We are reconfiguring, adapting, pivoting, and reinventing. We cannot rest on our comfortable assumptions that what is going on in our world and the church have nothing to do with each other. We are learning what our power is and what it is not. And also where it may be used for God's good purposes and where it has been used in the past against that purpose. We must examine the text handed down to us, like our Roman text today, and question our use of words that do not mean the same thing today, or the same thing to everyone who hears them. When St. Joseph home receives the children from the street in the home, they give them a cup of cold water. It is to tell them that we receive you as you are. You are not an object of charity. You are not a project, but persons in your own right, capable of making decisions for your own destiny. When we receive someone, someone in our midst, we may learn something from that person. 
and what we learn may make us uncomfortable. The Greek word that's translated in our text as welcome can also mean hospitality. And it's not coincidence that the word hospitality is used six times in our three gospel verses. The hospitality treatment of one of Jesus' servants earns one the reward typically reserved for the servant themselves. Those who do the apostles' work also deserve compensation. So, do you want to know what the compensation is? It is community. The challenge the church is facing in our time is like the challenge God set for Abraham. It is like the challenge Jesus set for the disciples. So my sibling in Christ, are we willing to risk our lives and our legacy to go out there and give a cup of coffee or water to someone who never you never met before even when it's created discomfort in us are we willing to do so without asking them to be like us are we willing to accept the unity without uniformity Let us profess our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered and from the Jesus Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, and he seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of sins, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Gather into one wherever you are, by the Holy Spirit. Let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but to the worst of the people. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. The God of all grace, bless you now and forever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord's face shine on you with grace and mercy. The Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Amen. Our closing hymn is on page 9 in your bulletin, Work Across the Crowded Ways of Life.
not uniformity. 